example. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we do praise you. We thank you for who you are. And we're grateful for the extremes that you've gone to on our behalf. We thank you that we have the opportunity to meet here in peace and safety, to open your word to our lives. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would open our lives to your word. We thank you, Father, for this incredible book that we're going to undertake the study of. We just thank you for its gift, its special blessings. We pray that your spirit would overrule all things, that indeed the meditations of our heart and the words of our, my mouth will be acceptable in your sight as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, we are going to study the book of Revelation. And one of the things that I think we'll do to start right off with, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and let's read through Revelation 1. And uh, not for detail, just for a f the flavor uh, of this book, this incredible book. And then we'll uh, take, uh, take a look at it. Are we together? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that was called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he heard behind me, a, and I heard, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. That's chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. Give you a flavor as we kick it off here. One of the most incredible books in the Bible. It's the only book of the Bible that has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. I know of no other book in the Bible that calls you to read it specifically. Many admonitions to read the Bible in general, but only one book rises above that and says, hey, read this one and you get a special blessing. And you will. That's why we're together. That blessing will take several forms. We'll talk about that. But it's, it's, it, God is faithful and you'll watch what happens. Another item I'd like to mention just right up front, this is one of those studies that is very strange because it is often avoided 
by people who have spent a lot of time in their Bible. Many pastors won't teach on it. They're uncomfortable with the book, and they have their reasons. Well, there's lots of viewpoints and so forth. One of the reasons, not necessarily always applicable, but one of the reasons is it does highlight one's lack of insight into the Old Testament. And we'll show you why as we go. But having said that, it is a book that promises a blessing, and it also strangely, even though it is, it is avoided by many so-called experts, it is a fabulous book for the new believer. That shocks many people. Many people say, gee, I haven't been in my Bible, where should I start? Some people point to the Gospel of John. That's a good, safe beginning. Others will say, start at Genesis. That's a, that'll join some issues right up front. That's great. But many I advise, jump into Revelation, and it surprises them. And you'll see why as we get into it. It's such a rewarding study. But uh, I encourage you to, to encourage new believers to join in this study. And let's move on. First, I want you to notice the title of the book is singular, not plural. How often I hear... Even pastors or people at the, in the public office especially will say revelations, plural, which means they've never read it. They've never even read the first sentence. And they, they assume because it's got all these visions and things, it's lots of revelations. No, that's not. It's a singular revelation. It's singular, not plural. The word apocalypsis is a noun. It shows up over 19 times. It means revelation. That is to unveil is what it really means. It's the unveiling. And uh, as a noun, it occur, uh, it's 19 times. As a verb, it's 26 times to reveal and to unveil, if you will. So, now, as we look at the New Testament, we realize there are five historical books, four Gospels in the book of Acts, Luke, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And then there are a group of epistles. Most people would list 14 Pauline epistles, setting aside the dispute about, Romans for the mo- uh, about Hebrews for the moment. There are 14 Pauline epistles, and there are seven sometimes called general epistles, or more precisely, the Hebrew Christian epistles. So if somebody asks you how many epistles are in the New Testament, most people answer 21. 14 Pauline and 7 general ones. That overlooks the 7 most important. There are 7 epistles in the New Testament written by Jesus Christ himself. And that's, they're contained in, in fact, the book of Revelation is like a cover letter that goes to these 7 churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Many of these churches you may have never have heard of except from this book. And what's rather astonishing, as you start thinking about it, are the ones that are not listed. Where's the church at Jerusalem? Where's the church at Rome? Even a superficial knowledge of the New Testament would cause you to list a handful of churches that are not listed here. And one of the questions I'm going to have you research between now and our next session is to reflect and be able to respond to why these seven that why did Jesus pick these particular seven? And therein lies some very fascinating discoveries. The scripture, John 16, tells us that he shall glorify me. The Old Testament glorifies Jesus Christ in prophecy. The whole Old Testament is really a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Gospels, we have his history on the earth. In the book of Acts, we see Christ active in the church through the Holy Spirit. The epistles then expand and exposit that and uh, gives us the, the experience and its relevance. But the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, is going to dramatize graphically Christ in glory. The great climax is what we're on the threshold of. The Old Testament says, Behold, He comes. The Gospels, Behold, He dies. And Acts, Behold, He lives in the church. Behold, He saves in the epistles. And we're going to see Him reign. We're going to see Him take over the earth and reign. Exciting times. Now, to whom is uh, this book given? Let's read the first sentence carefully. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Whoops. Unto whom? Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to Jesus Christ. If it sounds rather strange, it's the Father revealing to the Son. That's astonishing. Many people uh, have read that and don't stop to realize what it's saying. Why did he give it to the Son? To show unto his servants things which must quickly come to pass. The word uh, uh, shortly there is not shortly like like right now. It's quickly in the sense once it starts, it's going to come very quickly to get suddenly. Shortly come to pass. The word is the same word in the Greek from which we get the word for tachometer on a car. 
And he sent and signified it, signified it, if you will. See, it's given to him, and it's rendered into signs. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. We're going to see a lot about angels. Angels are going to be very prominent in this book. Angels uh, of all different ranks. Signified by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. We want to not lose sight of the fact that what we're seeing here is a record that John penned of what he actually saw. And he saw from a very astonishing point of view, which we'll take a look at. But I'd like to talk a little bit about the basic units of information. I have to apologize. That's been my technical background, but I think it's relevant to our study here. When we talk about the language, the basic unit in a written language, of course, is the alphabet. What, whatever language you have, the, the basic units typically are the letters of the alphabet. In sound, when I'm speaking to you, someone that would electronically analyze my sound would break it up in what's called phonemes the different sounds that make up the spoken language. Those are called phonemes. If we talk about images, this is a word most people have never heard of in the past, but most people today have heard it when you buy a camera or whatever, digital that is, you talk about pixels, the smallest unit of an image, if you will. What about meaning? There is a word in the information sciences called a semim. It's the basic unit of meaning. And that's exactly the word in the Greek that we have here where it speaks of a mark. Over 4,000, in fact, 45, almost 4,600 times in the Bible, we have a mark. Sometimes it's just a mark as you and I think of it simply, simplistically. Sometimes it's a, a seal. It, it, the word semim is a mark, and it also is a basic unit of meaning. And uh, one of the things that galvanized me as a teenager, I was a Christian, I'd been saved, I'd gone to church, but I happened to attend a lecture by one that person that became a very dear friend as the years went by, in which he was speaking about Revelation in an evening series at a church. And he happened to open the series by pointing out that the book of Revelation is entirely in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the Bible. Well, that grabbed me as a, you know, as a guy that was just interested in information anyway. Uh, uh, in fact, made it my profession, really, in effect. But uh, the, uh, the fact that Revelation was in code is no surprise. Anyone that skimmed the book, can get a little uncomfortable with the strange idioms there. But the fact that each one of those is explained somewhere in the Scripture is the real point. And that, that will launch you on a treasure hunt. And that treasure hunt is the most exciting thing you'll ever do in your life. I had, I've had a life I've, I, I've been, uh, of, of uh, adventures. I won't bore you with my background, but, uh, but the Lord has put me in more different interesting places through my uh, uh, career that uh, I've always been uh, somehow developed an appetite or a passion for adventures in lots of different ways. But the most exciting of my entire life is the adventure we're going to embark on together. And that's a treasure hunt in the Word of God. And there's nothing more fun than to take something and start looking and have it all suddenly become clear. It's just, I think that's fun. The word uh, uh, semeno is a, uh, to give a sign or signify or indicate or to make known. And that's what these symbols or semims are in the Scripture. Now, the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, focuses, of course, as most of you realize, on the catastrophic end crisis of the present age. And uh, we're going to see the spectacular reappearance of the King of Kings in his global empire. We're going to see the internment of Satan at last. Not finally. He's going to be put away for a while in the Abuso. We're going to see the millennial earth reign of Jesus Christ. Now, some of these are controversial. I'll touch about that shortly. And... Uh, We'll see the final insurrection and the abolition of sin. And we'll see a new heaven and a new earth. It's interesting that the creation that, that is being redeemed is not just you and I and not just the planet earth. We're going to see a new heaven and a new earth, interestingly enough. And that's all uh, laid out in Isaiah and elsewhere, but climaxed here in this very book. But I want to call your attention to verse 3 of chapter 1 that we read just shortly ago. This is one of several reiterations of this promise in the book, but let's keep it in front of us. The Bible says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. I want you to notice it claims to be prophecy. It claims to be prophecy from end to end. In fact, the whole Bible is prophecy, but let's not go down that path here. We clearly, there are people that do not regard the book of Revelation as prophecy. 
Well, they're entitled to their view. I'm not here to create controversies, but I call your attention to the fact that it claims to be. And we need to keep that in focus as we go. Now, I realize that many of you are regulars and you know the basic premises of our ministry, but so that this discussion can reach those that are, have walked into our group for the first time, let me go back and cover some very basic presumptions on our part. The first discovery that we've made that is one of the foundation stones of our ministry is that this, the Bible, this collection of books that's in your lap, consists of 66 separate books that were penned by over 40 different guys over several thousand years. And the discovery that is, you have to make for yourself is that these 66 books, consist, uh, of these 66 books, they consist of a message system, an integrated design. And I don't just mean thematically. I don't just mean that there's themes in the old, fulfilled, and the new. No, no, much more than that. Is that every number, every place name, the very structure of the text itself, even the mathematical structures underneath the text, demonstrate very skillful engineering. That's the first discovery. The second discovery when you've gone that far is you can demonstrate that the origin of that message system had to come from outside time because the very structure anticipates things before they happen. And as you begin to realize that, that will change your entire perspective of the Bible, that we have a message system very skillfully engineered from outside our space-time. And once you discover that, it changes your whole approach, perspective, and so forth. It has a central theme. The Old Testament, of course, is primarily an account of a nation. The New Testament is the account of a man. The creator of the universe became a man. And his appearance as a man is the central point, uh, turning point of all history. And he died to purchase you and me. And he's alive today. The astonishing thing isn't just that the Creator became a man. The more astonishing thing is that there is a man on the throne of God as we speak this evening. And our most exalted privilege is to know him, and that's what the Bible's all about, and that's what the book of Revelation specifically focuses on. In fact, the book of Revelation will become a lens through which we'll look at the rest of the whole Bible. And if we, if we do it diligently, it will it'll be full of surprises. Let's talk about some of our presuppositions, just to make sure you know where I'm coming from. It doesn't mean you have to agree with me. There are many good people that have very different views on some of the things we're going to talk about. But at the same time, I want you to understand where we're coming from, and more importantly, why. We believe God means what He says, and says what He means. And uh, the Bible is an integrated whole. Every detail is there by design. And Jesus so declared it. I remember when I first, one of the early stages in Israel, I remember I came across this strange proverb by the rabbi say that we really won't understand the passages in the scripture uh, until the Messiah comes. When the Messiah comes, he'll interpret not only the passages, the very words, the very letters, he'll even interpret the spaces between the letters. And when I, when I first heard that, I used to uh, uh, be kind of amused. I thought it was just a colorful exaggeration. There are many of those you run into, of course. Um, but then I read Matthew 5, 17, 18, where Jesus himself says that, uh, think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the prophets, I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, one yard, or one, uh, one yard or one tittle shall not pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. Now a yacht and a tittle are Hebraisms. A yacht uh, is one of the smallest of the 22 Hebrew letters. It looks like a little apostrophe. On the paper, it's almost like a little blemish. It's a little mark. A tittle is the little hook on some of the letters, the, the perception of which are essential to discern the difference of some of these letters that look alike otherwise. A little tittle. So a yacht and a tittle is equivalent sort of to you and I saying, not the crossing of the T or a dotting of an I shall pass till all be fulfilled. That, that's a call by Jesus himself to take the text seriously. And uh, now, I'm also going to suggest that nothing in the text is trivial. That's just as true of Leviticus as it is of Revelation. In Revelation, it become clearer because they'll leave out at you. In some of the other places in the Bible, you see these things, they sound like they, well, they're trivial little byproducts. No. You're going to, one of the great discoveries as you study your Bible seriously is that there's nothing in there trivial. Everything there is for our learning. That's what Paul tells you in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. And God is His own interpreter. God is His own interpreter. Most of the Passage, the, the, uh, the critical identities in the book of Revelation are interpreted in the book for you. You don't have to guess. Some of them you have to go 
dig in through the Old Testament, and I'll show you why in a minute. But also, I always forget to put this up. For years, I always did this for our group. If, you have, if you're taking some notes, I want you in the upper right-hand corner of your notepad to put the Acts 17.11. Just jot it down. What it says in Acts 17.11, Paul had gone from Thessalonica to Berea. And Bereans, the Bereans were like the people from Missouri. They had to be shown. You know, they were doubters. <laughs> Paul says of them, says, they were more noble, those in the Berea, those were more noble than those in Thessalonica, how? In that they received the Word, the Word of God, with all readiness or openness of mind, but they searched the Scriptures daily to prove whether those things were so. See, in other words, they had to be shown. What Luke is saying here is don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you. I hope my, my, my primary goal is to stimulate you to do your own homework, but on all these critical issues that I'll try to highlight for you, do your own homework and come to your own conclusions, because we're going to enter areas where good scholars disagree. And your anchor is not Chuck Missler or whoever. Your anchor is the Word of God. Check it out for yourself. Do your homework. That's the whole point. Well, the revelation, the unveiling, consummation of all things. It's the only book that pr promises special blessing. And one of the reasons it's such a blessing, the book of Revelation consists of 404 verses. We'll probably cover three tonight of those 100, 404. And you can do extrapolations and figure we'll be here for quite a while, but it won't go quite that slowly as we go. But 404 verses, but here's the exciting point. Those 404 verses contain allusions, direct allusions, to over 800 passages in the Old Testament. And they're all cataloged and indexed. They'll be in the notes that, that accompany uh, this uh, uh, presentation. We'll take it chapter by chapter and show you can check them out yourself. When you add them all up for the whole 24 uh, sessions or 22 chapters, you'll discover there's over 800 of these illusions. Some are very clear and direct. Some are a little more elusive, but they're there and, the, and, and so cataloged. But that's the point. You see, if, it sound, if the book of Revelation seems strange to our ears, it's because we haven't done enough time in the Old Testament. These idioms, these, these issues presume of uh, the Old Testament. That in, in, you can almost look at it as if John is assuming you've done your homework. And, uh, and of course, uh, the reason it's so important for all of us, it presents the climax of God's plan for you and me. Let's, before we jump in, talk a little bit about John himself, John the author. Interesting guy. Uh, he's written uh, five books in the New Testament. The Gospel of John that most of us are familiar with, and that's a great place to start. If you're ever at a loss where you want to jump in, jump into the Gospel of John. It's been described as um, shallow enough for a child to wade in, deep enough for an elephant to submerge in. In other words, it will meet you on your terms. It can be very simple and direct, and it's wonderful, but if you're, as you get more sophisticated, you, it, it, the more you go through it, the deeper it'll go. You can study John for 30 years for the hundredth time and make new discoveries every time you go through. It's a very unusual book in that regard. Done by the same guy that, that, that we're dealing with tonight. He also wrote three epistles, John did. The first John is a sermon it's in the form of a letter, but we're not sure to who exactly, probably Ephesus, but we're not sure. It's really like sermon notes on love. Fabulous, fabulous piece of work. Second John is a mystery to most. It's my suggestion for you to check out. I believe it's a personal letter to Mary, the mother of Christ. And I conclude that from the whole epistle, but especially the first sentence. You can check that out on your own. Third, John is a small personal note to Gaius. But then, of course, his climactic piece of work is the apocalypse that we're undertaking tonight. John the person. He was born in Bethsaida, younger brother uh, of James, to Zebedee and Salome. We infer that Zebedee was probably had some means because he funded this, this fishing enterprise that they were partners in with Peter and Andrew, and uh, they had servants, so it was not a trivial uh, enterprise of that kind. And his mother was Salome, not the Salome you may be thinking of, but uh, Salome is uh, also well-resourced and one of the major uh, uh, supporters of Christ's ministry. And she's very prominent in, uh, if you watch uh, the, the allusions to her. Uh, they were Galilean fishermen, and uh, in partners with Peter and Andrew, Peter, uh, James and John, that is, and Peter and Andrew. He was, John was, in, both of them probably, were early disciples of John the Baptist. And they later get, uh, become disciples of Christ, and they later get called by Christ to actually uh, be with him. We do infer that John was actually a well-connected guy because we discover that he knew the high priest personally somehow, and he also is the only one that really had direct commerce apparently with Nicodemus. 
because he records things that only he does. And, and, and uh, so we get the impression that he somehow was well connected. He is very misrepresented, by the way, by most Christian literature. We always view a soft, almost maybe effeminate, namby-pamby kind of guy. He's just the opposite. His nickname, he and his brother were known as the Sons of Thunder. They were a man's man, if you will. And you may recall in Luke 9, where they encounter some unbelief in Samaria. And it's John suggesting to Christ, let's call down fire on these people. And John said, Christ says, no, we're not going to operate that way. But John, John was ready to do it. He assumed we could do it like Elijah did. That was his, you, you don't get the, John was intensely devoted to Christ. Very passionate person. He, he ran deep. Peter was sort of reactive. He was, you know, he suffered from foot and mouth disease. The only time he changed feet, the only time you open his mouth is to change feet, as some people put it. Um, reactive. John ran deep. We also know he, he could run faster than Peter and so forth, but that's not important to us tonight. <laughs> John was one of the inner circle. As you study the Bible, you discover there are three that were very much inside. At the Mount Transfiguration, there were three, Peter, James, and John. At the raising of Jairus' daughter, the three of them were allowed right on in, where others were excluded. At the Olivet Discourse, they're joined by Andrew. The four of them get this private briefing on his second coming. And, of course, at Gethsemane, they all were at Gethsemane, but Peter, James, and John came, were brought in a little closer, if you notice the text carefully. So we get the impression clearly that Peter, James, and John were the inner circle, of it, in a sense. It's fascinating to realize that John was the one that Jesus consigned his mother to at the cross. He's on the cross. He's got brothers and sisters. No, not to, he doesn't consign his mother to one of them. He consigns it to the apostle John. And that's exactly what he does. He takes care of her. She, she and John are both buried near uh, Ephesus. And uh, that's important to understand. And so, he ulti- he obviously, he will be in exile at Patmos, but after he gets uh, uh, out of uh, Patmos, I'll come to that in a minute, he retires to Ephesus uh, after his exile. Now, if you look at a map of the, the Aegean between Turkey and uh, Greece, and you zero in on a little spot there on the map, if you'll see there, and get in a little closer, and uh, it's about 26 miles from the, uh, um, I think about 24, 26 miles, 24 miles from the Miletus, the peninsula on the coast. It's, in fact, when I was first on Patton, I've been there many times, but the first time I was on there, I couldn't help but see the comparison to Catalina, not only in its shape, but also its distance from the shore. It's very similar in many respects, uh, surprisingly. For those of you that happen to be familiar with Catalina, that's useful, I suppose, if it isn't that isn't. The, uh, all right. Um, anyway, um, so you'll notice you'll notice the uh, the uh, location of Patmos there. Very strangely, you know, sort of a, it's sort of a crescent. The game you play there is with wind, windsurfing. You try to windsurf outside the lee of the island and then windsurf in and if you, if you miss it you get caught by the antimony which will take you all the way to Libya so you want to really know what you're doing there um, <laughs> that's, a, that's sort of a chicken race thing they play there but anyway that's Patmos and uh, so the Patmos exile is what we're in the middle of John was exiled by Domitian who reigned from 81 to 96 AD and it's clear some people try to make the book of Revelation dated earlier but they're finding they're, they're, th- those views are brutally assaulted by the facts. Um, Domitian uh, finishes at 96 A.D. He's replaced by Trajan. When Domitian dies, John is freed and goes back to Ephesus and retires. Domitian was the brother of Titus, you may recall, who uh, 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 destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D. But um, a little, some other uh, traditions of the church, this does not mean they're accurate, but just so you know where they come from, Hippolytus, who wrote in the 2nd century, uh, has promoted the story that John was first plunged into boiling oil, and when that didn't have any effect, they exiled him to, uh, to, to, the, to uh, Patmos. And that's a very colorful story, but I think most serious scholars don't regard it seriously. It's just one of those legends that show up. Uh, Victorinus uh, uh, indicates that John was forced to work in the mines that were located on Patmos. Uh, there, I don't think we have any, any other evidence of that. But Irenaeus, Clement, and Eusebius... Uh, point out that after Domitian dies, John was returned to Ephesus. He went to the churches, pointed out leaders, and set things in order. Now, he's, he's, by this time, he's getting on in years, and uh, so he's really uh, 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 
at the end, in the twilight uh, time, of, he, he did die a natural death, just as Christ implied that he would. Okay, now there are alternative views of the book of Revelation that I want to get out on the table. There is a view called of the preterists. They argue that the book of Revelation was only ap applicable in the first century. It was true only then and then only. And uh, we don't take that seriously for a number of reasons. That doesn't mean we're right, but I just want you to understand where we're coming from. There are these other views. There are some that feel the book is historical. It was written later and it sort of recaps history. That's their view. There is an idea, what some people would call the idealist view, that the entire book is strictly allegorical that Christ reigns in our hearts, not literally on the earth, etc. And they, they make everything just a big allegory. And uh, uh, that, that really started uh, from uh, Oregon and uh, Augustine and uh, was carried on through from a medieval church into Reformation and unfortunately is the heritage of most denominations today. There's a, th a fourth view that we, are, uh, we lean to and that is the futurist, that it's prophetic. And, it and we'll show you why we believe that. You should come to your own conclusions from your own study, but I want to let you understand where we're coming from and be, be aware that there are other views. And the book of Revelation claims to be the latter. It claims to be prophecy all through it, cover to cover. And uh, so, why prophecy? Why are we interested in prophecy? Well, in the Old Testament, there are over 1,800 references to Christ's rule on the earth. Very explicit all through the Old Testament, not in a few places, almost 2,000 places. 17 Old Testament books give prominence to that very issue, the ruling of the Messiah on the earth. It was so focused on, it's one of the reasons that the leadership, when Christ was on the earth, failed to recognize him. They were so fixated on the ruling aspect. They often, the Jews, will hold, some hold to the view that there's two Messiahs, the suffering servant, uh, ben Yosef and the Ben David. The ruling, there's a suffering servant and they see two Messiahs. They're so different. It never occurred to them probably that they're two sides of the same guy. But in any case, 17 Old Testament books give, give a prominence to the rule of Christ on the earth. In the New Testament, out of 216 chapters of the New Testament, there are 318 references to his second coming in the New Testament. So it's important. It's mentioned in 23 of the 27 books. And... Uh, the three that it do, don't mention are single chapter books to the private individuals and Galatians. And uh, so uh, still, most people still sort of believe that life's going to be just a linear extrapolation. Tomorrow will be like yesterday, next week like last week, next month like last month, next year like last year. We tend to be linear in our extrapolations. But the Bible says quite to the contrary. There's some real surprises coming. For every prophecy of Christ's first coming, there are somewhere between seven and eight prophecies of his second coming. Is it important? Absolutely. Were the first, the prophecies of the first coming fulfilled literally? Absolutely. And we maintain the second, the prophecy of the second coming will be just as literal. Now we're jumping into a field of study called eschatology. That's a fancy word for study of the last things. And when you study eschatology, the first fork in the road you come to is you will tend to be either amillennial or premillennial, meaning you either if you're amillennial, you don't really believe that Christ is literally going to rule on the earth as a king for a thousand years, like Revelation portrays. You allegorize that. If you believe in a literal millennium, which we do, then you're called premillennial. Amillennial, no millennium. Premillennial, believe in a millennium. That's your first fork in the road. There used to be a group called postmillennial, people that felt we were already in the millennium. But as we got into the 19th century, most people gave that up. They began to realize things are not getting better and better in a moral way. And uh, so it, 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 it's, uh, it, it, or as way Chuck Smith likes to say, if we're in the millennium, then Satan's chain is too long. See? So there are other beliefs that are sort of affiliated with this. Preterism and Reconstructionism are issues we don't have to get into here, but are again non pre millennial. Now the point is, hermeneutics is your theory of interpretation. And your, your tendency as you interpret the Bible can be very literal, that's where we lean obviously, or you may be very willing to allegorize. Well, the, the Bible says that, but doesn't really mean that. And you start treating these things as allegories. If you lean to the left on this chart and are, are given to alleg excessive allegorical uh, ideas, that will, you, that, you, that will drift you in, in the direction of amillennialism. If you're very strict in your hermeneutics, if you have a very, what they call a high view of inspiration, if you think the Holy Spirit really picked every letter and word 
through the, through the penman, then you will go the other way. So your eschatology will derive from your hermeneutics. So that's why very important for you to come, to come to grips with how you treat your Bible. If you treat it very seriously, you take it very, very literally, then you're going to lean to the right side. Now when I say literally, don't jump on me and say, well, gee, then you think God has feathers. Because of Psalm 91, under his wings thou shalt trust. Yeah. There are, obviously, in the Scripture, figures of speech. The most conspicuous ones, of course, are allegories, metaphors, similes. Similes are easily identified because it's always like this or as that you are you're like you know, when there's the word like or as you know it's a simile metaphors are like a simile except that you don't get the clue with the with the like or as but still it's a figure of speech you are the salt of the earth you know is, does that mean you ionize when you're wet no 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 it means, <laughs> no it's it's a term it's it, it, it's 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 an expression to make another point those are called metaphors do you know how many different kinds of figures of speech, different rhetorical, rhetorical devices are in the different kinds of rhetorical devices in the Bible. I mentioned about four already: similes, metaphors, um, types. Um, uh, and we could go on. Do you know how many there are? Over two hundred, and they're all listed and cataloged with examples from the Scripture uh, in, as in our appendices to some of our, our materials. And that's not, we're not going to get down, caught up in that, but I just want you to be aware of the fact, just because you take the Bible literally doesn't mean you're blind to the use of figures of speech. The Holy Spirit deals in puns. It's important to understand that, and so forth. Now, the first division, though, many people have different perceptions of eschatology, different viewpoints, and that's fine. But this first dividing uh, point between amillennialism and premillennialism is deeper than just eschatology. So I don't want to pass by this without making a few... To be amillennial, and, and the reason this is so important, here's the tragedy. Most classical, traditional, Protestant uh, denominations are amillennial. They, gain, they, they, they derive that from the, uh, from the Catholic Church, which is amillennial. And so uh, this is difficult because most of the people you run into that are denominational Christians are amillennial, whether they realize it or not. The problem you have, you've got to deal with the hundreds of messianic promises throughout the Old Testament. God is very explicit about Christ ruling on the throne of David. He's never done that before. Is that allegorical? The destiny of Israel is paramount here. One reason we had the Holocaust in Germany is because of the silent pulpits in Germany that failed to deal with God's place for Israel. Israel has a destiny in God's covenants. Paul, in his definitive statement of Christian doctrine we call the book of Romans, hammers away for three chapters, 9, 10, and 11. God is not through with Israel. They have a prophetic destiny. We need to understand that. We need to understand that. We need to deal with the promise that angel Gabriel gave Mary when he announced the birth of Jesus, that he would sit on the throne of David. The throne of David did not exist in those days. Is that allegorical? I don't think so. God promised it in depth throughout the Old Testament and confirmed in the New. So we need to deal with that. And of course, there's all kinds of confirmations of things I've just mentioned in the New Testament. So it's a non-trivial issue. And the tragedy is, if you embrace amillennialism, you run the risk of poking your finger in the eye of God. You're calling, in effect, maybe unknowingly, but you're calling God a liar. We serve a God who delights in making and keeping His promises. And that's what we're dealing with here. So if you're premillennial, you'll discover that doesn't end your headaches. You've got three different brand, you know, brands of premillennialists. It has to do with when does the church get raptured? And um, some feel that the church will be raptured at the, e at the end of the tribulation. And uh, they're called post-tribulational, at the end of tribulation. You'll discover that we lean the other way. We think the church will not even see the tribulation. So we're pre-tribulation. We think the rapture occurs before the tribulation starts. There is an offshoot of both of these that say, well, we believe it's going to be in the middle of the tribulation. And I'll set those issues aside now. Just be aware of the fact that the, the, that's another area of, of division that need not be an impediment to fellowship. Many people make a big thing of that, and that's a mistake too. We're saved, we're saved, and the Lord will sort it out for us. But still, we're going to, we're going to show you why we lean very strongly to being pre-tribulation. Here again, it depends on your hermeneutics. The more you're allegorical, the more you can swing to the left on this, on this chart, towards post-tribulationalism. If you're very strict in your hermeneutics, you take it very literally, you'll tend to be premillennial and pre-tribulational as a subset of that. Are we together? 
you'll discover it's very rare to find someone's premillennial and post-tribulational. Most post-tribulational people are also, in effect, amillennials. So it's, 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 there, there are some notable scholars that were exceptions, but that's un, they're unusual. Something else you're going to be very sensitive to, uh, sensitive to as we go here is the sevenfold structure of the book. As soon as you get to chapter 6, you're going to encounter the seven-sealed scroll. And each seal uh, is broken, ushers in a whole bunch of wild things. And you'll discover that there's all, of these seven, there's six and then a parenthesis. It's almost as if there's a build-up, first, second, third. When you get to sixth, you almost need to catch your breath. So there's a change of subject for a chapter. Chapter seven stuck in there to give you a chance to catch your breath. When you get to the seventh seal, then it breaks up into seven trumpets. And again, you go through trumpet one, trumpet two, you go through these. And when you get to the sixth trumpet, there's again, you catch your breath. And there's a parenthesis. This time, from chapters 10 through 14 are stuck in between those last, the, the, the last two trumpets. And when you finish, get through ten, this, this sort of what, we, what, what scholars call a parenthesis, when you finish that, you get uh, to the uh, seventh trumpet, ends up ushering in seven bowls of God's wrath. And even here, again, when you get to the sixth bowl, there is a parenthesis. It's, only, it's, just, a, it's just a little one, uh, but it's still it's a parenthesis. And so, for what it's worth. So we, you can't help but notice, as you get more familiar with the book, that there's this heptatic structure. Heptatic's a fancy word for sevenfold. Everything's in sevens, okay? In fact, it gets even more complicated. When you look at the bowls more carefully, and you go back and compare them to the trumpet judgments, you'll discover... There's a parallelism. The trumpet judgments are anticipatory, sort of, of the seven, trump, uh, seven bowls, except they're about a third. And uh, so uh, as you go through this, uh, you know, in one case you have the, the sea of blood and all died at the end, but the, in the trumpets in anticipation, only a third in the sea died. Now you'll notice that there's a, some people call them the, 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 uh, the first group of these the uh, judgment of the thirds. All that's saying is that they've no, scholars have noticed a parallelism. It's not perfect, but it's just suggestive. I throw it out for your consideration. Well, the sevens that everybody recognizes right away in the Scripture, there are seven churches that will be the primary focus of chapters 2 and 3. And they're the most important chapters of the entire book. If you're going to only attend a couple of sessions, I encourage you to focus on chapters 2 and 3 because they're the ones that affect you and I. From chapter 4 on, we're going to watch from the mezzanine anyway. I'll show you why when we get there. Okay. But once we deal with chapters 2 and 3, then we're going to encounter this seven-sealed book, a scroll with seven seals. Very big deal. But then we, uh, when, as, after those seals are open, there are the seven trumpets that we just reviewed, and after the seven trumpets, seven bowls. So everybody that's even a superficial knowledge of the book recognizes somehow everything's in sevens, you have no idea. There are seven lampstands, seven spirits, seven stars, seven lamps, seven title pairs, seven promises of the overcomer, seven horns and seven eyes. And it goes on, seven angels. And uh, we're going to talk more. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, seven thunders, seven thousand, seven heads, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven mountains, seven kings. We're just getting started. One of the things that we give our graduate students a challenge to do is make a list and try to find a seven that's not on our list, and our list has hundreds, okay? But uh, there are seven Beatitudes. Now, this is something, we're getting more subtle ones. You don't have them listed that way, but uh, you find in chapter 1, blessed is he that readeth. We read that one, and they that keep, hear and keep those things, right? In chapter 14, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. That's a Beatitude. And uh, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments in chapter 16. Chapter 19, blessed are they who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, we get to uh, uh, chapter 20, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. The first and second, those are not events, they're categories. Be careful of that one. But uh, blessed is he that keepeth the words of the prophecy of this book. And blessed are they that wash their, wash their robes. And so in chapter 22. It's interesting that there's not six or eight, there's seven. And uh, there are more subtle ones that take a little more perspective. There are seven features in chapter 1. There are seven letter divisions in chapter 2 and 3. Those are pretty obvious. Seven personages in chapters 12 and 13. Chapter 12 and 13 is a parenthesis. You have a woman, a man-child, a red dragon, a seven-headed beast, a false prophet, Michael the archangel, and the Lamb of God. There's seven players, and sort of a, these are sort of summary chapters. And... Uh, 
There are seven years of judgments, chapter 11, 12, and 13. There are seven I am statements in the, throughout the book. There are seven doxologies in heavens. There are seven new things in chapters 20 and 21. And you could go on and on and on and on. I, I suspect it's probably not possible to make an exhaustive list of the sevens. Whatever number you come up with, I think there's seven times that many. <laughs> okay. That's just a, a, a perspective of my own. Something else you'll notice as you go through the book, you'll always notice that there are all kinds of phrases that are time-dimensional. They speak with past, present, and future. The present is now, the past is a memory, the future is a, bro- is a hope, right? God in Revelation chapter 1, the God which was, which is, and which is to come. Remember that? It's the expression of God. The very yad he vav the the Yehovah, somebody, or Jehovah the, as, in, from the German or whatever. We, you know, the unpronounceable name of God is a statement of existence. The God I am. He always has been, always will be. Okay? He's the God that which was, which is, and which is to come. That's an echo from Colossians 1, John 8, Hebrews 7. Revelation 1, verse 7. So uh, that's a t- they're tenses. When you talk about Jesus Christ, it says he's the faithful witness. That's past tense. The first begotten of the dead. That's present tense. And he's the prince of the kings of the earth. That's coming. See, again, it's past, present, future all the way through. And the references are there. They'll be in your notes. Unto him that loved us and washed us from his, our sins in his blood and made us kings and priests. He loved us. Notice the past tense. Whenever you see the past tense of God's love, it's an allusion to the cross. But that's past. It's happened already. The present tense, he washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's now. That's happening. And the future tense, he made us kings and priests. That's coming. And you want to pay attention to that phrase. Kings and priests. That shocks the ear of the Old Testament reader because in the Old Testament, you know, the kings were the line of Judah, the priests from, the line, from, the, uh, from Aaron and the line of David, uh, Levi. And they never did cross. Several episodes were wrong when they were crossed, if you will. Priests and kings were separate in the Old Testament, and, and deliberately so. There was an exception to that in Melchizedek, and that example is used by the writer of the book of Hebrews to make a big deal that Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But then Peter, in 1 Peter 2 and Luke 19 and Revelation in several places, emphasizes that you and I are kings and priests. The more you know about kings and priests, the more shocking that is. We're both. That's going to be very important as we get before we get to chapter 5 to understand that because there's a group of people that identify themselves on that very aspect. Now we get to verse 19 of chapter 1. There's a verse that outlines the book for you. The book of Revelation, to the best of my knowledge, is the only book in the Bible that provides you an outline. Usually in any study of the book of the Bible, one of the first things you want to do for yourself is sort of outline it, get a feeling for how it's organized. Well, Revelation gives it for you. Thank goodness. In chapter 1, verse 19, John is instructed to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta, after these things, hereafter. Well, what were the things he had seen? By the time you get to verse 19, the things he'd seen were verses 12 to 18, the vision of Christ. Chapter 1 has this incredible vision of Jesus Christ. And John said, write what you've seen, this vision of Christ, that's past tense, Write the things which are, and that's going to turn out to be the seven churches. Because those are churches that were in place, live and real, running at the time John was penning this. It was present tense. And write the things which shall be metatauta in the Greek. It means after these things or hereafter. When you get to chapter 4, verse 1, the opening phrase of chapter 4, verse 1 is metatauta hereafter. And then it goes on to these wild things from chapter 4 to the end of the book is future. So you got past the vision that John saw while he's on Patmos. The things which are, these letters to the, that are dictated to him by Jesus Christ that he writes. And the things which then shall be hereafter. And that of course is appended as a cover letter on, on, to all the seven that get mailed out of course to the churches. Okay. Past, present, future. It may surprise you to discover your salvation has three tenses. Did you know that? We use that term being saved to mean so many different things. I got saved from a fire last night. The apartment's on fire and they saved me from the fire. Well, that means in the context of that, a certain thing, right? 
Let's talk about the three tenses of being saved. In the first place, past tense. You have been saved, hopefully. That is positionally. Before the court, you have been saved from the penalty of sin. Who paid that penalty? I can't hear you. That's great. Amen. Gotcha. That's a positional thing. The, the, some of the theologians would call that justification salvation. You're justified before the, 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 the bar of justice or law because Jesus paid your penalty for you. So you have been saved. You've been saved from the penalty of sin. Present tense, you are right now being saved. From what? From the power of sin. Romans 5, 6, 7 hammers this. You, that sin should no longer reign in your mortal bodies. Yes, you may stumble here and there. But you should be repentant, which means you don't just say you're sorry. You turn 180 degrees the other way. If you're living in sin, you stop it. If you're having an affair outside your marriage, you stop it. You don't just say, gee, I'm sorry, I'm going to be under grace. No, you stop it. If you're subject to some other sinful addiction, the power of the Holy Spirit breaks that. You are saved from the power of sin. That's operationally, and that's not by your energy. It's by the Holy Spirit, moment by moment. And that's what Romans 6 is all about. You need to study it carefully. Some people would call that sanctification, to give it a different name. And there's a future aspect. You shall be saved from the presence of sin. And that's called in Romans 8, the redemption of our body. But your salvation has three tenses, past, present, and future, depending on whether you're talking the position, or the penalty, the power, or the presence of, of sin. So if you all nod in agreement, you flunk the chorus. That's supposed to disturb you enough to go back and study those things, okay? Okay, let's move on. Another thing we're going to encounter as you study the Bible is a thing called types. In engineering, we speak of prototypes. A type is a model of something for some purpose. And you can make a mathematical model of an oil field to understand something. You make a mathematical model of an airplane wing before you design it. Those, those are models. The biblical term is like a type. There's a prototype and an epitype. Abraham and Isaac, in Genesis 22, it's called the Akedah, when Abraham offers Isaac. He is acting out a prophecy. He knows he is. He names the place, the Mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And it was his belief that if he offered Isaac, Isaac would be resurrected. That saved him. That's what he... Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 19 emphasizes. So that whole study of Genesis 22, fascinating study, but it's the classic example of what's called in the literature a type. Abraham is a type of a father, Isaac the son. The whole model is the father offering his son as for an offering for sin. And uh, Abraham probably didn't realize that on that very spot, 2,000 years later, another father would offer his son as an offering for sin. But uh, So that's a whole study. But that's what we call a type. It's the classic example. Another type is often pointed as Nebuchadnezzar's image in Daniel chapter 3. The king of the known world makes an image and forces people under penalty of death to worship him. The whole fiery furnace thing is a, a, a foreshadowing, in a sense, of Revelation 13 and, uh, and, and so forth. That's a type. The redemption of the land in the book of Ruth. You won't understand a kinsman redeemer unless you understand the book of Ruth. In fact, before we get to Re Revelation chapter 5, your assignment will be to study carefully the book of Ruth. Four chapters. Take you less than an hour to read it. It is so fun. I've taught that book dozens of times, and every time I go through, I make a new discovery. It's fun. But the main thing, is it, you, you'll learn what a kinsman redeemer is all about. That's what that, one of the reasons that book is there. And then, of course, we have a model of the book of Revelation. It's called the book of Joshua. Joshua is a, is, is a Hebrew term for Jesus. Or put it the other way around. Yeshua is Yehoshua. It's the same equivalent word. So here we have a military leader in Joshua dispossessing the land of the usurpers on behalf of the people of God. And he does that by sending in first two spies, two witnesses. And those two witnesses get Rahab saved, right? And then they march around seven times with the trumpets and then they, they, they end up fighting an alliance of these seven kings under Adonai Zedek who calls himself the Lord of Righteousness and he gets defeated by signs of the sun and the moon and the kings that get defeated say rocks, hide in caves, rocks fall on us. The more you read Joshua, you'll discover it's structurally an, an, a model of the book of Revelation in advance. So in a sense, it's a type also. And we could go on the tabernacle. Boy, you want to do a serious study of the book, in the book of Exodus of the tabernacle. Every detail, every dimension, every material points to Jesus Christ. 
it rested on silver sockets. Silver rests on its blood. Silver is a symbol of blood. And the more you know about the Levitical idioms there, the more you'll see that every detail points to Jesus Christ. When you're outside, you see nothing but the white linen. All you see is righteousness. And there's only one door. Anybody that goes out other than through that door is a thief and a robber. And uh, you, the first thing you come to is the brazen altar, sacrifice first, then the washing. And then you go into the holy place. And as you go into every detail, every detail speaks of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ makes an I am statement for all seven pieces of furniture in that tabernacle. It's, a, it's again a fascinating type of the Messiah himself. Anyway, we go on and on. There are hundreds of types, some very conspicuous, some subtle. What we're dealing with here are idioms. And uh, it's interesting, Abraham is called the friend of God. How many knew that? If I say the friend of God, it's Abraham, right? And God associates that with letting him know what's going on. Is he not my friend? Shall I not tell him what I'm going to do? In Genesis uh, uh, 18, right? And uh, so that's Abraham. How about the New Testament? Who are Jesus' friends? The disciples. In the upper room, he says, you were my servants. Henceforth, you are my friends. And what does he do in John 14? He tells them that he's going to come back for them. He gives them prophets, prophetic insights. So the friend of God is associated with prophetic insights with Abraham in the Old Testament and the disciple in the New. So he gives the, the friend of God idea, the concept, is linked to a glimpse of what's coming. Well, let's carry that to the extreme. The ultimate friend is one that's dearly beloved. That's a friend squared, right? I mean, it's, it's up a notch, right? Who in the Old Testament, was, which prophet was known as dearly beloved? Daniel, exactly. Who in the, and of course Daniel has the apocalyptic prophecies, right? Who in the New Testament? John, right. So dearly beloved is associated with the apocalyptic writings. Prophecy squared, if you will. I mention this, it's not a big deal, except I want you to get a sense of the fact that this entire package we call the Bible has been designed there is a principle that scholars will call the principle of expositional constancy. All that's a fancy word means there's a tendency of the idioms to be consistent in the old, in, in, across the different books. And I'll show you some surprising examples of that before we're through. What's your protection of staying on track? What keeps you from getting into these side uh, tangents and so forth? what's called the whole counsel of God. Always make sure Christ is at the center of what you're talking about. If you've got a passage you don't understand, put Christ right in the middle of it and see what happens. And Peter tells us in, in, in his second letter that even though he's an eyewitness, you've got something better. You have the more sure word, his term, more sure word of prophecy. Prophecy is more convicting, more convincing, more impressive than any other fact you'll find on the planet Earth. We have a thing there, how sure can we be? You've, many of you have been through that with us. Jesus challenges you. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. John 5, 39. So Christ makes that very claim. Challenge it. In Psalm 40, verse 7, he says, the volume of the book is written of me. And I don't think there's a passage in the entire Bible that you can separate from, the, from Jesus Christ in one way or another. And Revelation even underscores this in chapter 19. It'll say the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now is the Bible prophetic, the prophecies all relate some way to the mission, destiny, and victory of Jesus Christ. In fact, we pray that whenever we pray the Lord's Prayer. Most people don't realize that. Thy kingdom come. What does that mean? You're praying that those prophecies will be fulfilled and that his kingdom comes. And when you pray that, I don't think you can do that as a non-millennialist. Unless you do it well in my heart. I hope he's there already. Let's go on. Okay. Now, John says, I was in the Spirit several times, four times. But the important one to keep in mind is in chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. There are a lot of people, many commentators, well, he must have been, that means Sunday. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The Lord's Day was established centuries later as Sunday. That's a whole other history I won't go into here. If you read that as, I was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord, you got the meaning. That's what Joel talks about. John, through the Spirit, was brought forward through time. And given, he was, he was uh, given the ability to see what's going to happen. I was in the Spirit, and I don't know whether it was a trance, I don't know how that mechanically happened, but clearly he was in a time warp of sorts, and he is, in, he is propelled to the day of the Lord, even though he's on Patmos, of course. In chapter 4, he's going to be in the Spirit, to, uh, to the throne in heaven, 
That's important. See, he has this vision of Christ in chapter 1. He's going to get these seven letters. But in chapter 4, he's going to be in the throne room at the climax. And there, chapter 4 is going to be a very important chapter for you and I to understand, or the rest of the book won't make much sense to you. And, of course, in chapter 7, he's carried away in the wilderness, and then he's carried up to a mountain that's uh, uh, it, later in the book. Okay. There's another phrase that shows up as sort of markers. It's almost like a symphony, and you've got certain scorings in the symphony that, that organize it for you. There's the phrase, thunders, voices, lightnings, and an earthquake, that is repeated four times. Once with regard to the throne in chapter 4, once in charge to the opening of the seven seals in chapter 8, once to the trumpets in chapter 11, and once to the bowls in chapter 16, usually at the, at the end of those sequences. But we have these thunders, voices, lightnings, and earthquake. And, uh, and some people try to make the book as if it's, those are four parallels, four stanzas in parallel with it. Other, most scholars think they're sequential, but that we'll deal with that as we go along. There are also doxologies. There's four of them. It's interesting that they escalate. They're climactic. Glory and dominion is only two. Then in chapter 4, it's glory, honor, and power in chapter 3. And then it's blessing, honor, glory, and power, 4 in chapter 5. You get chapter 7, there's seven of them. Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might, and so on. I won't split hairs of what the differences are. I'll leave that to you to do your own word study. But the point is clearly, as you get into the book, you'll see it build up as a crescendo. It looks like a symphony. Then there's worship. Or songs, if you like. How many are there? Make a guess. Seven. Good guess. Okay. Holy, holy, holy. We have in chapter 4. The testimony of the Trinity, incidentally. Worthy art thou. That's emphasized all through here. Unto him that sitteth, and so forth. Unto, uh, salvation to our God. Amen. Blessing. Kingdom of this world, and so forth. We give thee thanks. Great and marvelous. And the four hallelujahs in, uh, in, uh, ch in the, uh, chapter 19. It's interesting that many of these words, if you take... The Old and New Testament together, they're always a multiple of seven. There are 24 hallelujahs in the Old Testament. There's four in the New. When you put them together, it's 28, which is a multiple of seven. It's an evidence of integral of design. Do you follow where I'm headed? Okay. Let's move on. There are several things that are out of place that Revelation corrects. The first is Israel. They need to be in the land. Oh, by the way, have you noticed? <laughs> That's being corrected. Not finished yet. The church is on the earth. Uh-uh. It's supposed to be in heaven. And it will be. The Lamb is supposed to be on His throne. He's not yet. He's on His Father's throne. The day is coming when the Father is going to say to the Son, go get Him. And that starts a whole bunch of exciting things. It hasn't happened yet. Satan is free to run around. He's going to be bound for a thousand years. These four things will be put where they should be. There are three women in the book of Revelation. The wife of yod heh vav -Heh, or Yehovah, if you will, the wife. That's the woman that's summarized in Revelation chapter 12. It's Israel. It's not the church. A lot of people assume it's the church because for some reasons that it's interpreted for you by none other than Israel himself, Jacob himself. But the point is, is that um, the easy way to summarize this, if, if the woman in Revelation 12 is the church, she's in tr big trouble because she's pregnant. She's going to give forth the franchise. And, and the, no, the church is always portrayed as the virgin bride. In fact, that's the second one we're going to talk about, the virgin bride of Christ. That's the church. Don't confuse Israel and the church. Throughout your entire Bible study, you need to be very sensitive to the fact that Israel and the church have different origins and different destinies. You need to be sensitive to that. Don't, don't let those get confused. Many, many prominent teachers are very um, loose with that discernment. And the third woman is the harlot. Mystery Babylon. That's the woman who rides the beast. These are three different women. Israel, the church, and Mystery Babylon, which we'll deal with when we get there. There are two big events in God's domain. The creation, obviously, and the, and the conferences are full of people dealing with the creation story and so forth. That's important. And, of course, the redemption. Which is more important? Well, how do you tell what's more important? Well, first of all, let's talk about the space that's devoted to it. The creation, how much space in the Bible is devoted to creation? Well, you've got a couple of chapters in Genesis, a few Psalms, a few chapters in Job, and some passages in Isaiah, and that's about it. You can get your arms around all the passages that deal with the creation pretty, pretty easily. What about redemption? What pass, what, what, how much of the Bible is dealt with redemption? Well, uh, the whole book of Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Joshua, it's all about Ruth, all the prophets, 
the Gospels, the Epistles, and of course the book of Revelation. Redemption gets a lot of coverage. It's obviously, in, in some respects, the bigger issue for us. What about the price? That's another way to talk about it. Well, the creation was breathed, God breathed it from his nostrils. You get the impression God could create another universe with, a, I'll, I'll, I'll figuratively say this, snap of fingers or something. What did the redemption cost him? His son. The redemption is the big issue. That's what we want to focus and understand. Not that the creation isn't worth study, don't misunderstand me, but we're going to really be plunged right into this issue of the redemption. That's what the revelation is all about. One of the things you're going to want to be sensitive to is the contrast between Genesis and the book of Revelation. Everything that was in the Bible starts in Genesis, and everything that starts in Genesis gets climaxed in Revelation. Let me give you some examples. The earth was created in Genesis 1. It passes away in, Genesis, in Revelation 21. The sun was to govern the day in Genesis 1. There's no need for the sun in Revelation 21. The darkness he called night in Genesis 1. There is no night there, according to Revelation 22. The waters he called the seas in chapter 1. There is no more sea in chapter 21. I have no idea what that means. There's a river for the earth's blessing in chapter 2. There's a river for the new earth in chapter 22 in Revelation. The earth's government was through Israel in chapter 37. The earth's judgment again will be through Israel in chapter 16 of Revelation. Man was created in God's image in chapter 1, and man is headed by Satan's image in Revelation 13. The entrance of sin in Genesis 3, in contrast to the end of sin in Revelation 21. The curse is pronounced in Genesis 3. There is no more curse in, Genesis, in Revelation 22. Death enters in chapter 3. There is no more death in chapter 21. Man is driven out of Eden in Genesis 3. Man is restored in Revelation 22. That's what it's all about. The tree of life is guarded in chapter 3, and the right to the tree of life, and, and the reason it's guarded is to preserve it, so there will be a right to the tree of life in chapter 22. That's often misunderstood by many. Sorrow and suffering enter in chapter 3. There is no more sorrow in Revelation 22. That always bothers me. How can God wipe away the tears of their eyes in heaven if there's no more sorrow? If there's no more sorrow, what are they crying about? You know what I think it might be? Lost opportunities. I think we'll be very analogous to Schindler at that last scene in Schindler's List where he realized that his little badge could have saved one more Jew. We will realize, as you go look back at our life, the opportunities that we've squandered. Nimrod founds Babylon in chapter 10, and Babylon falls in chapter 17 and 18. In Genesis 6 through 9, we have God's flood to destroy the evil generation. And in chapter 12, Satan's flood tries to destroy the elect generation. And of course, in Genesis, we have a bow of God's promise. And in Genesis 4, we have a bow for remembrance. Sodom and Egypt, representing corruption and judgment in chapter 13 and 19. Sodom and Egypt, referring to Jerusalem in chapter 11. Confederation of, was against Abraham's people in Genesis 14. And we're going to see a confederation against Abraham's seed in Revelation 12. In, Ge in Genesis 24, we had a bride for Abraham's son. And in Revelation 21, we have a bride for Abraham's seed. In Genesis, we have the marriage of the first Adam, and in Revelation, you have a marriage of the last Adam. Exciting stuff. Man's dominion ceased, and Satan's begun in, in, in uh, Genesis 3. In Revelation 22, Satan's domain ends, and man's is restored. Praise God. Hallelujah. One integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. It's one book. It's an integrated design. And if you come away from the study with nothing else, that'll be a treasure. Over 8,000 predictive verses make up the Bible and almost 2,000 different predictions on over 700 different matters, according to at least just one categorization in, in J. Barton Payne's encyclopedia. That's one example. There's diff different scholars would catalog them, catalog them slightly differently. And there are major themes going on in the world today, each one of which is a fulfillment of a pro theme of prophecy, whether it's Israel, Jerusalem, the Temple, the city of Babylon, the Magog invasion, the rise of China, the European superstate, the ec move towards an ecumenical religion, the rise of global government, or the rise of the occult. All these things are predicted in Scripture. All of these things you can track today in an intelligence gathering sense, and you'll discover the more you know about the Bible and the more you know about what's really going on, the more convergent they all are. Not just one of them, not, not some little proof text, the whole thing. So here's your challenge. I've told you about a lot of things tonight that um, you need to study for yourself. 
But there's one, I'm going to put this on the screen, a challenge, which if you accept this premise on the screen, you flunk. I want you to disprove the thing I'm putting on the screen. That you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's a preposterous statement. That you and I are entering a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the gospel period. How do you challenge that period? Don't accept it. How do you challenge it? You have to do two things. The first is find out what the Bible says about all these things. Not what Chuck Missler says or whoever, what the Bible says. The second thing you've got to do, used to be hard, it's not today. Find out what's going on. And you won't on the 10 o'clock news. Our, all but one of our major media has prostituted their mandate as they tried to topple a sitting president during time of war by publishing things they knew were not true, trying to shape opinion rather than inform it. They've disc- for, the good news is they've dis- clearly discredited themselves in the mind of the average American. The good news is, aside from the major media, you've got all kinds of news services, World Net Daily and others on the Internet. You've got talk radio. There's all kinds of ways today that they're, have gotten around the stranglehold of the made nine media. Find out what's really happening in Israel, in Europe, in China, everywhere. And the more you know about your Bible, the more you know what's going on, the more excited you'll get because it's all coming to a climax. But the ultimate issue is that you and I are in fact in possession of a message system. That message system is of extraterrestrial origin. And it portrays you and me as objects of an unseen warfare. You and I are being contested over as we speak, day by day, moment by moment. We're both the prize and the pawns in that, in that uh, conflict. And our eternal destiny, it, it, eternal destiny individually depends on our relationship with the ultimate victor in that conflict. That's what it's all about. And the question that you're going to ask yourself every time we're together is, where do you stand with respect to him, the one that's going to win this conflict that's going on? Now, I want to give you, before we close, a few suggestions about how to study. Many people ask me, gee, what do I do, Chuck? Well, first thing, you always pray first, and you will not understand what we're talking about unless you have a relationship with the author, which is Jesus Christ. So if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, or if you need to renew that relationship, do so in the privacy of your own counsels, but do so as we go, because it's a prerequisite to God revealing to you what he's all about. So the first thing is prayer and relationship with that author. Then the other thing you want to do is set aside your presuppositions. I will tell you mine so you're aware of what mine are to evaluate yourself. But set aside your own and go at the scripture with an open mind and let the Holy Spirit deal with these issues. Not Chuck Missler. I also encourage you to take extensive notes. As I look back at my 50 years of Bible study, I wish I had been more systematic and jotting things down and pulling them together. Fortunately, with today's technology, there are all kinds of aids to create word-searchable notes. And I prefer to make my notes independent of a Bible package. All these Bible packages have ways to make notes, and that's fine. The trouble is you may want to change Bible packages someday. So I use a standard word processor and use your own system, but pull notes together, always referencing it to the Scripture. But I'm going to tell you another little secret that I love to get in right up front. And that's, I'm going to encourage you people to start a secret journal. Your girls know what I'm talking about. The guys have the foggiest notion of what I'm talking about. (laughs) You can go to a stationery store and buy what they call a journal. It's a bound book, not loose life. It's a, not loose leaf. It's a bound book, blank pages, maybe lined, but blank pages. And what you resolve up front is never to show it to anybody, ever. You do that because I want you to be really candid with yourself. If you have any suspicion you may show it to someone, it'll cloud that. This is secret. It's your own private treasure. The more secret it is, the more valuable it will be to you. And what you do, when you come across a passage in the Bible, you don't understand, it makes no sense, it seems to contradict X with Y or whatever, what you do is you take a journal, put down the date, put down the reference, and then here's the hard part. You do this in in ink, not pencil. Try to describe in your journal why it is that passage confuses you. Well, it seems to contradict, or it's just not clear. Try to capture in writing, in ink, privately, why it is that verse puzzles you. Once you've done that, close your journal, go before the throne of God with words to the effect, Father, you've promised that the Holy Spirit would teach me all things, not some things, all things. 
Well, Father, I don't understand verse 7 of chapter 3 of Hezekiah. I'm making that up, of course. Um, I don't understand that. I'm asking you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in accordance with the commitment you've given me to illuminate that verse for me in the name of Jesus and so forth and tie it off. Now, I'm not going to suggest that it's going to get resolved in the next 10 seconds. Big flash of lightning and, oh, wow, there's the answer. But I tell you what will happen. You'll be reading somewhere else and it'll suddenly click. Or you may over, be r- driving and hear some preacher talking about it, and it'll happen. It may not even be talking about that issue, but something he'll say will cause you, oh, I get it. Follow me? You may be in a restaurant, and you'll overhear a conversation at another table. It's got nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but for some reason that will, like, I have no idea what the Lord is going to do, but he will do something. And well, here's what's going to be the problem. It then will be so obvious, you will have forgotten how much it puzzled you. I want you to go back to your journal, to that page. Put down the date and describe the means that the Lord used to clarify that puzzling verse. Now you say, gee, Chuck, that sounds great, but it's a lot of paperwork. What for? I'll tell you what for. Because the day will come when you will go through your valley of doubt. There'll be something happen. You'll be going through a stage in your life where you may feel, gee, I think I've gotten carried away with it all. Am I really sure? You'll have your doubts. I want you to go back to that journal and read how the Holy Spirit carried you on his footprints through life. That journal will become so precious to you because it won't be Chuck Missler or Teacher X or Teacher Y. It'll be the Holy Spirit that guided you from one difficulty to the next. And that, those trail markers will be precious to you to the extent you can be candid with yourself up front. And as you do that, it'll be one of your most treasured possessions. So I encourage you. And by the way, when you do have a verse, I'll give you another shortcut. When you have a verse that puzzles you, try putting Christ right in the middle of it and see what happens. But uh, there are also, I'm going to encourage you, some people say, use the Bible, don't read commentaries. A lot of people preach that. I don't. I think you you want to get some exegetical helps, that is translational helps. Get a Strong's Concordance if you don't have one. Uh, There's computer software today that's absolutely flabbergasting what it'll do for you. Some are very expensive, some are very fancy, all kinds. Uh, there's also ex- expositional helps, commentaries. Don't rely on one. Get several because the, they're, the, each, each one has their different, their different views. I encourage you. One of the things I'm going to encourage you to do is make the Bible your hobby. What do I mean by that? Invest in it. How many of you have hobbies? Can I see a show of hands? Anybody without their hands up probably was likely to lie about other things too. Um, <laughs> um, you probably have more invested in your hobby than your wife. you want your wife to find out. You probably know more about your hobby than you your profession. It's a labor of love. Make the Bible your hobby. What do I mean by that? Invest in it. Buy some helps. Build, a, build your own little library of, of a concordance and some commentaries and some helps. So when you have a question, you can jump right in and find out who, wh- why was Ahithophel the you know, grandfather of Bathsheba? What, what's that all about? You can quickly go down some of these trails without spending a whole Sunday afternoon. You can do it in five, t- five or ten minutes and get the, oh, wow, I see. Well, great. So invest in it. That, anyway, so for what it's worth. For the next session, I want you to, first of all, read the book of Revelation. It's not that big a deal. Read it through. But especially, I want you to reread, especially, you review chapter 1, of course, because you'll touch on that, but then read chapter 2 and 3, the seven letters to seven churches. And what I'm going to suggest to you, those seven churches, each letter has seven elements. So you can take a spreadsheet, if you're inclined, with seven rows the, the name of the church and the title Christ uses themselves. There's about seven elements. And seven churches, we'll go through this next time you get the idea. But I want you to make your own spreadsheet to discover that there's seven elements of those seven churches, seven by seven, 49 little boxes you're going to fill in. And, uh, but I want you to ask yourself the question, why those seven churches? Read the seven churches and be prepared to, if I asked you to write a one-page essay, and why, did, why those seven? I want you to think about that for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Exciting book. It'll change your whole perspective, not just of the Bible, but of life itself. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that that word became incarnate and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. 
full of grace and truth. We thank you, Father, that you've gone to such extremes that we might live, that you've brought each one of us to this point in time for your purpose. We understand, Father, no accidents in your kingdom that we're all here right now by a divine appointment. We pray, Father, especially that your purpose would be accomplished in our lives, each of us individually. We pray, Father, you'd help each of us to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, that you would help each of us to be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities you put before us. Oh, Father, we would just ask that you would just take over our lives, each of us, that we might be more pleasing in your sight as we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen.